I'm back for another podcast and I've got another special guest. I have Matthew Birkby with me. He decided to take time out from doing a 15 years with electronic artists. He's doing new stuff. He's planning some new stuff, but he was the global media director. So Matthew, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Um, what possessed you to decide to venture into a new world <laughs> after all of this crazy stuff that we've had for two years well you know like i've done i've done 15 years at ea um many many different roles um and that's a long time and mm -hmm. uh pandemic was also a moment for us to all think about things now i am not part of the great resignation i'm more of a it was a it was a moment for me to take stock i'm, I'm at a point in my career where i could take a little step back reevaluate things and kind of explore a little bit for me and to also you know look for some other opportunities ea was an amazing place i learned so much i pivoted my career in so many different ways there but now was the moment to to i don't know whether it was bravely step back or step forward or whatever it was but um it's uh yeah it's some um, i'm exploring things and uh that that was the moment it was it was perfect for it was perfect for me so so when you joined ea yeah this is where my age might creep up with me yep um we were still on some consoles that no longer exist right we were we so i joined ea and the playstation we were still making games for playstation 2 the playstation 3 hadn't launched in the uk xbox 360 was still a thing and everyone was excited by this new phenomenon from um, nintendo called the nintendo wii wow and i had to use some crazy website to to find a find a woolworths actually i got it from Woolworths. Oh, wow so that's that that tells you um and and the other random thing is is i didn't have a facebook thing page no facebook didn't exist i was all about myspace oh wow so so oh wow there's some people watching it and go what's my space exactly <laughs> exactly oh so so you entered social media and, and you're now really discovering linkedin again i am from the journey of a cv site to a social platform yep and your new myspace <laughs> uh, it's, it's that what do you like about linkedin um I think the thing I so the first thing I like about LinkedIn um, or that I'm liking and rediscovering about LinkedIn is actually it's more than just CVs. So this is going to sound really bad, but the first app that I open in the morning now is so bad. This is so bad is LinkedIn because I get a, a peculiar blend of people and news for my industry. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the reasons that I left EA is because I'm passionate about the media industry and there wasn't another space really unless that i could get all of the news in one place there wasn't a space where i could meet people and so that you have this interesting that dynamic of people sharing knowledge publishers publishing as they always have done and you've got this this melting pot of real people talking about real things that are that i'm interested in which is why it's the first app of the day that i open which is terrible <laughs> When I do a workshop, I ask people, when you wake up in a morning, do you A, turn and look at your other half and think how privileged you are to have them in your life? Or do you pick up your phone and see what happened overnight? And usually everybody just grins. Yeah. Yeah. 100%, 100% agree to that. Because clearly I'm looking over to my wife and saying, yes, I'm a lucky, lucky man. We didn't kind of rehearse this question. So, uh, well, yeah. we didn't rehearse this at all, but but this wasn't on our uh, pre-discussion. But as a senior decision maker yep. in a very well-known brand name, you must have seen some of the annoying stuff of LinkedIn, right? Um, let, oh, let me... Can you sort of dive, so, dive a bit deeper on what you would so consider annoying? Did you get a lot of generic sales pitches? Yes. Yeah. Did you get a lot of email outreaches that were yes. relevant? 
100 um, irrelevant so many so much that was irrelevant or the wrong moment and did you find did you find that some of it i don't want to put words in your mouth so disagree with me if you if sure you, i often say that if you're given that we're in such a cluttered world now everybody's time is sapped that you you either have to create that curiosity like you discover something yep or you have to have such an a game message like it's unreal there, there's no middle ground now you you either have to provoke somebody with content or have such a razor sharp message in the com in the in the inbox what do you what do you take on that so, so the first i think i think the first thing is that yeah for a long time linkedin was 100 percent just random random messages um from random people um and usually it was ad tech for me personally mm -hmm. and i will say that i never responded to any of it because it's just not it, it wasn't the right way to approach it i think the what you're really describing is to a certain extent just a classic classic advertising classic media you know you either got to be you got to have the thing that that person wants at that moment in time mm -hmm. and they've already got to know about it in some way yeah or you or you've got to it's got to be phenomenal in some form or another um and really is you know you mentioned cluttered is your linkedin inbox really the right place immediately to just fire off straight away with a with a pitch for a piece of ad tech that i may or may not want or a, a service that i may or may not want at that moment I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't think that's the the right approach. Now, if you have a thing and you're publishing and you're and and my curiosity to your point is like, hmm, that that's kind of interesting. Um, I think you can that there's a there's a it's I hate to say it's a softer sell, but it's um it's a more it's a more genuine thing. Like get to know the person, but you either pique their interest and then get to know the person or get to know the person and then slowly introduce the thing but don't just come in with like buy this thing from me because it's amazing and it's going to solve your life problems or whatever it is your 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 objective because that's just never that 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 hasn't worked for me personally um and i would say is i feel as well i feel for people whose targets are 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 set in that kind of manner because it i I don't know like I, I just don't i don't think that sales technique works anymore and to be honest did it ever really work i don't know like what was it just well, a numbers game well i think i think you know there's an element of any sales or marketing that involves numbers but when you think about you know if you're you have a 19 you know the the numbers on kind of cold messaging is mm -hmm. it's a one percent less than a one percent success rate yep now if, if i was going for a job interview with you right and i say and you said to me what's your success rate as a salesperson and i said about one percent you wouldn't hire me it's not a great conversion rate is it no but because that one percent might be worth a hundred grand or fifty grand we forget the 99 yep fair fair um but i argue and coming to your point about linkedin is this kind of place where people are information is you know you can find news and it's this kind of bubble mm -hmm. of lots of different things in one place which i don't yep. think other social platforms have in the same way no i think you'd be more successful with the 99 if you actually built the relationships because some yeah. people would hear you out just because you're a nice guy or a nice person or what have you but isn't to be fair the canny salesperson always that i suspect the most successful canny salespeople always did that anyway yeah um even before digital even before we were doing this mm -hmm. like my, my wife at one point or other she would hate, hate me for saying this sold cars on the forecourt Wow. and it was all about getting to know the people like there was some classic from the story she told me some classic um classic car sales people mm -hmm. but where she found most success was 
just understanding, being polite, get to know the person. Don't do the hard sell there and then because and and I, I think it's the same. It, mm -hmm. it has to be the same. And to be fair, you know, there's a certain element of priming as well. You know, you have to prime someone through it, mm -hmm. um, I would say. And that's no different than whether you're selling on LinkedIn or you're looking for business on LinkedIn or if you're if you're creating a video game, you know, one of the things for, for us is, you know, we're prime, we're building the memory structure in someone with advertising to eventually at some point you are going to buy that thing, whatever yeah. th th that that game is, because it's already there. We just got to remind and that, you. And that's the same really in sales, marketing, advertising yeah. is instead of trying to, you know, I'm sure you didn't didn't sit in EA going, how can we find the 100,000 people or however many you sell, million people who will buy this game? What you went out and said is, we know that this is the market, the size of the market. How can we get that, that market energized about this game? That's certainly one part of the, that, that would be one part of the funnel that we would be working to. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's transferable, that that concept is transferable uh across industries yeah. across businesses yeah uh, yeah so so coming to to the way the world's we've said like the sales piece has never really changed it's always about relationships and, yep. and doing all that stuff what do you see about kind of advertising marketing that has changed and that maybe you can see stuff on the horizon that's going to shake things up a bit i think it's well, the first thing I'd say is conceptually advertising hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Like human beings fundamentally have not changed. They haven't evolved. You know, like we don't evolve in 10 years, in 50 years, in, in like it takes a little longer than that. So mm -hmm. we like to think that we do, but conceptually we don't. Mm -hmm. um, we're all the same. And so we've seen, we've seen obviously the, the rise of digital is, is, has been phenomenal. I think what's fascinating for me personally, um, and an area that I explore a lot is the influence of space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's, that's going to become, it's already regulated, but it's going to become more regulated mm -hmm. um, as the, the concept of what influencer is and isn't um, starts to change. And why I think that's interesting for uh, advertising teams, for, for, for media teams, for marketing teams is, is, where does that sit? Does that sit within your, does the, the investment for those teams sit within the community, the influencer teams? Does it sit within the media team? Should then, should their barriers be broken down between those teams? So that I'm really fascinated with. Mm -hmm. And then um, to anyone who's obviously w w within the, the media and marketing space, the, the changing regulations around privacy around the the deprecation of the cookie that that's this is not new news mm -hmm. but it's going to you know within the next couple of years that's going to rapidly um change i think what that means then is how we work with our consumers data evolves i think mm -hmm. we will we'll start to see more and more we are seeing more and more partnerships uh you know i posted something on linkedin i saw yesterday um which was um, from a company called Infosum, the clean room. There are other clean rooms. I'm also a big fan of Habu, amongst others. Um, the brands working together in a privacy safe manner will accelerate. And the challenge there over the next couple of years will be who manages that? Who's responsible for that? How do you get the legal teams involved to make this happen at speed? So that's going to be a really interesting thing. And then you'd be sticking your head in the sand um somewhat if you hadn't heard of the the metaverse and web3 and nfts and all of that side of things now lots of brands are exploring conceptually what mm -hmm. that might mean for them um personally on if you were thinking about the bell curve of adoption i think we're really early i think it's a really interesting space um mass adoption not sure yet um virtual reality mass adoption i think we're a few hundred million units of, away from adoption you know like if you think about i don't know if you ever bought a 3d tv i never bought a 3d tv because like with the glasses and my eyes it's just, yeah. just never gonna happen 
but um the the thing i think about that is that the, the mass adoption never really happened and they sold loads of those mm -hmm. if you think about virtual reality meta or facebook or whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. sell a lot now that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen it's just a time frame yeah um of when that happens and then the challenge becomes as well for the the broader public everybody is so you say metaverse but what do you mean do you mean like is that roblox is that decentraland is that some thing that the that, that, that meta's making in reality labs like what do you mean and because mm -hmm. you can't easily explain it mm -hmm. I don't know whether the adoption like I think I think we're much much sooner it doesn't mean that brands shouldn't experiment because it's I think it's a really fascinating space for experimentation and um for new experiences and if you think about uh, I, I'm gonna say something terrible now if you think about Gen Z and younger and younger and Gen A um it's perfectly natural for people to play in these spaces. And so they are going to move through and become parents at some point. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of meeting people, experimenting, going and watching a concert, going and playing in, I don't know, in Nike space or being in Spotify space in on Roblox, that's going to be entirely natural to them. Mm -hmm. But the mass adoption where we're we're all walking around in AR and VR glasses and things, I don't know. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm slightly like, hmm. I I was talking to um somebody on Facebook about digital marketing and and you know I said what wh where do you see this all go? And there was one rather bold digital marketer on there who said, oh, we're already gearing up for this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're building our lab out, and I'm like. Yeah. For what? You know, it reminds me of, and I'm going to show my age. Yep. The the Blu-ray versus HD T C D or whatever it was called. Yep. I can't remember what it was. But they were both running and nobody really knew which way they were going to land. And it feels like at the moment there's there's an idea here, there's an idea here. Yeah. But there's not really a kind of so what does this actually mean and elon musk said you know we both wear glasses i love i had an oculus thing and loved playing on it for a little bit but then had the difficulty of going actually this hurts my eyes mm -hmm. and i'm like i just i get it i understand it but it feels like the world doesn't exist for it it feels like there's a social media platform there with no users i think that's that's a fair observation. I think the thing that we might say is that here's the thing. So I remember talking to my dad a long time ago. Why would I use Facebook? Why would I tell someone that I'm having a pint? Why would I do that? He's on Facebook all the time now. I'm like, why are you still on Facebook? Like, why are you still doing that? And I think I wonder if um, it's not that it's, I think there's different ways to connect with people. And I think the whatever augmented reality or virtual reality or holographic technology, because that's also a thing that, you know, we don't talk, there's not being talked about, but I think is, is fascinating. Like imagine if you and I, rather than see, seeing each other through a flat screen, there was a hologram of Dean in front of me and, and, I think we'd get a more visceral, oh God, I sound like a marketing person there, a more visceral human experience. Um, but um, I think there's this, this is just the next step in technology. Mm. Um, and I think that everyone gets excited about it. And then there'll be a moment of disillusion because there always is with this technology. Like the dot com bubble, isn't it? There was like, it's that, oh. it's that entirely. Um, and but I, I I would say is if you look at science fiction from thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and that's not that long ago, really. Like uh, you and I are probably wandering around with this communicator device in our pockets. Yeah. And thirty years ago, they'd have gone, "What? What are you talking about? How? How? how what? You're going to be able to video phone me? That? No, that's that's that can't be a thing." And so. 
that's why I'm kind of like, okay, there's people pushing for this. They might be looking for a solution to a problem that doesn't necessarily exist. Mm -hmm. But the concept of connecting people in ever more visceral ways is interesting. And then the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around the de the decentralized community thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, I kind of see that that's a really interesting space. And, and then if you, you keep flowing on that, the concept of blockchain overall, like transparent ledger, whatever that is between two parties and particularly in advertising, like the, like the, the supply path from when you see an ad to when I bought it on a pop it's so opaque. It's going to like, there's so many things that are just not quite right. Mm -hmm. we if there are so many interesting things that it could solve problems for mm -hmm. that would then enable the world to be a a nicer place and maybe that's the thing maybe that's actually the thing our trust in so many institutions has fallen by the wayside that human yeah. beings are looking for connection with people that think and around the world the that is more visceral than doing it through a flat screen. Um, and I would say as well is I don't have the imagination to imagine what it could be. Mm -hmm. I'll be holding on, like desperately holding on. Like I will be on every single thing. But um, at the moment, I think it's probably too hard. It's too intangible at the moment, isn't it? Yes, 100%. 100% and it's too hard mm -hmm. like to your point like if I have to think about putting that thing on my head um all of those other things how do I then sell you that mm -hmm. whereas if you think if we go all the way back whether you like or dislike what Steve Jobs stood for the concept that Apple had with the iPod like the idea of me saying to you right got you've got a thousand songs in your pocket oh that's great that's a really easy thing for someone to, to to like that's that oh wow moment yeah and i don't know whether we've quite found the oh wow i'll still be going in and having a laugh and like you know i was in the spotify roblox space the other day don't really know what i'm doing in there i feel a bit weird being on roblox but like i need to understand what the platform's doing um I have an Oculus fund. I refuse to just go out. I'm like, I refuse to just go out and buy one. Like I could, but I refuse. So I'm like, just whenever I sell a thing on eBay, it's like, okay, that's going in the Oculus fund. And I will just then go and buy that. So I will get that one of those as well, because I want to experience it mm -hmm. um, and see the potential benefits. And I, and I just love that brands are pushing into these spaces, knowing that maybe there's not a tangible benefit right now. But I bet they're learning a ton of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to see, like, I've thought about how does ads work in the metaverse? How does that whole piece work? And oh. um, I, I've thought of the weird ones where you're literally walking through a, a room and, of course, it's, hello, Dean, and another person all, all creeps up and it's like, whoa, that's weird. Yeah. And all that. Um, but there must be, you know, but uh, some, I was listening to a video from somebody. Uh, um, I can't remember it was. And imagine you're walking down a street in the metaverse. Yep. And suddenly all you see is one particular brand. Yep. And people are drinking that brand and the billboards of that brand. But none of the people are real that you're seeing. And it's like, how do we... This is a bit kind of heavy duty, probably for a podcast. <laughs> as, a, as a human, yep. the fact that we see holographic or image representations of people drinking a drink that aren't real, the whole thing's constructed, but the impression is still in our heads. That's quite scary. It is, and it isn't. Well, we uh, see it on commercials all the time. Exactly. And, th and that's what I was going to say. And in fact, even, you know, I know not all chatbots are great, but like when I go through my, my, my mortgage thing that I have to do in June, 
I'll go through a, a, a mortgage provider that I know is going to put me through a chatbot to begin with. And I'm quite comfortable with that. I think, but you do touch on something and it does trigger a thought in my mind about, okay, so you, you're in this space and it's all one brand and the, and the people there are going, yeah, oh, this is amazing. How do we ensure that Dean knows 100% that that's an ad? Mm -hmm. So it has to be clear, and this comes a little bit back to the influencer space before that I mentioned. Is yeah, have to be very clear that that it's an ad in some form. Like someone needs to know these are like I'm seeing an ad here, and and so we have that, which then brings me on to legislation. The the people legislating wherever they are in every territory are going to have to be very clear around the rules of this. We have rules around advertising for a reason. Mm -hmm. um and you know and that's to ensure that the industry abides by certain standards that we we, that we don't um that, we, that we're ethical and actually that we do the right thing i mean when you think about it human beings perceptions are very vulnerable yes um you know and effectively um we're getting into a very dangerous time where we can't tell what's real and what isn't. That's fair. But given that the metaverse is, and you know, blockchain is aimed to be decentralized. Yep. How does that, how do we protect ourselves from being, you know, you've seen the deep fakes. Yep. And some of them are getting really good. I watched a guy on TikTok who does Tom, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Oh, oh. Yeah. And it's like, oh, other than yeah. you look a bit too young. <laughs> yeah. But you you start to realize that the the reality, we're not really sure what's real anymore. We're not. Um, and I, you know, that that I think that that's where um you start to I think brands will start to with with industry start to legislate for that but also to say responsible brands mm -hmm. will say okay we, we're not going to do that that type of thing um and if you think about brands moving into more ethical spaces at the moment i i suspect if we were to look 5 10 15 years ahead the brands will have a perspective on what's the right thing to do. Um, so in the same way that brand safety is really important for us and not and not funding um, uh, content that, that funds hate um, or, 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 or terrorism, I suspect that what you'll see is um, brands also being very clear about where, where it is that they stand in that space. Now the challenge becomes is that the internet, the metaverse, Web three, whatever you want to call it, the ever expanding mind of of technology beyond, isn't always necessarily the most ethical space. And I think that the that becomes then it's 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 important for all of us to make sure that we understand as much as we can, that we try and educate ourselves, you know. You, you think about this as a, you know, you, I could roll it all the way back to what what video games companies do to try and help parents understand about the safety features that that are built into consoles, so that they can stop their their children playing with people that they shouldn't be playing with or hmm. or spending money on things. I think people are going to expect that from brands, hmm. um, but it is down on us to to also. I don't know whether be educated is the right phrase, but like, don't blindly go into this, into this new world going, ah, oh, yeah, it's all going to be lovely. Like take a, take a moment of trying to understand a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's coming. I think that's the thing. It's coming. And you know, I, you know, I think, I think the world goes in around in circles. It does. Yeah. We go around in cycles and, uh, I hope nobody misunderstands me here because I don't mean how this may be perceived. But in the 
early part of the 20th century or even 90, late end of the 19th century, a lot of businesses did have some values. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not every business, but there was a sense of, you know, um, people would, you know, dealt with in a particular way. And then, and then, you know, there was business values, you know, hand, handshakes and things like that, that meant something. And then I think we went into a phase kind of post-war where it got a bit more slick, a bit more grifterish, shall we say. That's a tough way of explaining. No, but things like, you know, you buy an insurance policy that actually in the terms and conditions, it's sold as an insurance policy for this, but when you try and claim, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's buried in terms and conditions. We saw that with the pandemic, loads of people having insurance for various things and then, oh no, this doesn't count. So I'm not saying that everybody's out to cheat people, but I think business values generally just eroded with the make money. And, you know, you can hear about companies making billions and billions and billions, but they're paying people minimum wage. And I think, I think this cycle, whilst technology is involved, humans are still driving that cycle. And humans will come back to actually, we want to invest in brands that care. Which yep. is a bit like Woolworths <laughs> many years ago. Bringing it all the way back to Woolworths. Oh, that's funny. Um, it is. It's like John Lewis, uh, the, the 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 John Lewis partnership. Um, I th I think the, there's another interesting thing that's emerging is that um, brands are also now starting to have a point of view mm. um, on many topics, and I think one of the other aspects to it, and this is to bring it back to sort of a a more, I suppose, a business aspect is, you know, if you think about growth usually comes from a couple of places, from investment, from product, all of those standard things. But one of the most important things that a brand has is the people that work for it. Mm -hmm. And people expect, people expect you to have a perspective. People expect a brand, a company to have a perspective. And if you want to hire the brightest talent, um or the you know the, the most diverse group of amazing people they're going to want your company to have a point of view and to have a set of values and to live by them and i think you know you start to see that emerging more now with the erosion of trust in other entities mm -hmm. you know you know the erosion in trust in government in in journalism in advertising um <laughs> in one form or another but if you want the greatest talent, you're going to have to start to think about that. And that and that's your values. That's how you think about people internally. That's how you know how you focused on inclusion, on, on sustainability. All of these aspects for a business, large or small, if you want the best talent, you're going to have to think about that. And those values will flow through all the way into, into then you growing your business. I, it does seem intangible, like it doesn't seem like a logical thing, but actually a lot of what a brand is or a business is, is the people behind it. And, and actually, if you look, you know, just to kind of keep going back in time, a lot of the businesses of old, many of them who don't exist anymore. Let's just put to side the cultural changes we've had in society for a minute. Mm -hmm. and let's not get into that bit. But if you look at a lot of the old brands that used to exist or still exist in some form, they started out with a mission. Yes. An actual, they wanted to do something. Yes. Um, whereas a lot of companies now, they're lost in the world of we just do, we make things. or and, and now that whole thing of the purpose behind something is coming back. What's the big mission that personally people can go, yeah, I'm in for that. Yeah. And and they and they and they want that. Your employees want that in one form or another. Um, and certainly as you start to, you know, you start to pull in a younger generation, expect that. If you if you're not thinking about that now, mm -hmm. you should be. Um, because you won't attract the the best and the brightest across the spectrum. 
Um, and, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm quite passionate about that. I, th I think it's a really important thing for, for people to be thinking about. And, um, you know, I saw that, that, that change, mm -hmm. um, through my career. This was not something that was really, you know, when I think about when I way, way, way back when I started work, I mean, I had, like, like, it's just not a thing. It's just not a thing that people would really talk about. Um, or and, and have a perspective on and now you go all the way now and and they do and i think that that encourages people to enjoy work more mm -hmm. work is more than work i think that's the other thing as well yeah. yeah you're paid to go and do a thing but it's so much more than that it's so it's a it's a richer yeah. thing that you that you're going to so you want to reflect that you think about it you know you work and effectively the best most active years of your life you trade yes yeah you think about it you get your youth in school and you learn all this stuff then you go to work work 40 hours which always ends up more because it's always that way yes and then you reach the peak where you kind of like you've done so well it's now a slippery slope downwards uh, and, oh, no. <laughs> and basically you go i've devoted my life to exchanging the most energized part of my life for this yes the money was great but did you do anything did it mean anything and and i think you know if you start to wonder and i think that's why people want purpose they want values they want brands they want companies to stand up for something uh, to include people to think about the, the sustainability like so, there's so much it's such a rich topic mm -hmm. but um it definitely then you know you start to then to, you know if you flip it back into the the metaverse you start to then there you know, we, I don't think any brand, any company ever says, right, we're going to do the worst things that we can ever do. We're going to like, like, what's, what's the, like, they, I don't think anyone ever set out, like, well, I hope they didn't, but let's just imagine that they didn't. And then for whatever reason, you know, it was all whatever, uh, and, and profit was good, you know, all of that side of things. And profit is good. Profit drives to growth. Profit leads to all kinds of innovation and all kinds of things. But if your employees, if they're not into it and company B is going to do those things and they feel proud to work there, I know where I'd work. I'd go and work for the one with the purpose and the, and the values and all of those things. Um, and then, you know, in the end, brand A, which was just about the profit over the long run, I wonder who's going to survive. Yeah. So thinking about that, yes you've you've ventured out into the unknown you're yes. taking some time to kind of rest after a 15 year slog slog's a tough word but yeah, yeah. But it had, had 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 moments of slog yeah 15 years of you know to be fair not a lot of people if you think about it not, not a lot of people are involved in a business one business for 15 years these days so being no. in, in something for 15 years is incredible compared to you know, most people's, I think the average job lifespan now is two years before you change to something else. Mm -hmm. But that's an incredible change of, you know, certainty being around people and an organization you understand and, and a workflow and a pattern to your life that you've kind of decided to change. Yeah. And you're taking a little bit of time out to kind of appreciate what that change might be. But what's next for you? What are you looking to do next? So 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 thank you for for describing it like that i i never thought that i'd be there for 15 years first of all i, I would just say that and it didn't feel like 15 years because every couple of years i was doing something different um i was you know to i hate to use the analogy of that climbing wall because everyone uses that these days about their career but mine really was that i was literally like oh i'm interested in that i'm going to make that grab over there but for me I, i've i've um I'm taking this time to um, actually get fit, which I haven't, I've, been, I've neglected. 
I've neglected a little bit, but I'm now back out there pounding the streets. Um, but now I'm looking to take the things that I've learned across my career into an uh, and into another brand or to help other brands. And I, and I, I kind of, I, I hesitate to say directly brand because I am thinking, is it brand side? Is it agency side? Is it ad tech platform side? Um, because I, I have a kind of a, it's unusual to have a, a media career where you've, you've touched all aspects of, of media and advertising. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for brands that interest me. Um, so I'm, you know, I spend a lot, spend a lot of time on the LinkedIn in the job space. I have all the alerts set up, um, <laughs> of course. Um, but equally it's, for me at the moment, I'm in a position where I don't need to jump at the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm spending a lot of time talking with people. I'm having interesting conversations that I'm actually finding intellectually stimulating, um, which is great. Um, and we'll see, we'll see where I end up. It's, um, it's kind of fascinating at the moment. The, the, you know, we talked at length somewhat about the, about the metaverse and places, advertising, media, marketing, it's never been more interesting. Yeah. It's like there is so much happening um, that for anybody who's listening in, in any kind of space, there's so much now. Like if, if you're thinking about making a move and, and you're and you're you want to, you you should like I can recommend it. Like I actually am I saw someone the other day and then they said to me, I've never seen you so happy. And I'm like, yeah, that's because I'm like I'm allowing myself the time to to really be quite quite deliberate with mm. with 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 where I end up, and I'm very very lucky. I'm in that position to do that. I know also lots of people are not in that position, so I also acknowledge that. Um, but um, I suspect I'll be at a brand in some form in in some sort of media role, um, but we'll see. You never know. I might I might go and become a yoga teacher. I'm not yeah. going to become a yoga teacher. Just you never, you never know. You might be the head of the Spotify space at Roblox. <laughs> you never know. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I, I actually did a podcast recently with the head of talent for Roblox. Really? Yeah. So I can give you a word in if you want. Oh, I wouldn't mind. They're like, what's so? So the random thing I'll tell you um, is um, I did just short of two years in the US for for EA, and. Um, I literally lived like a stone throw from the Roblox office. I always wondered, like, how are they making any money? Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. So um, you're exploring LinkedIn. Yes. Um, you're having a look on there so people can come find you. I'm assuming other than if they want to try and sell you something, you're great to explore and get to know different people. Uh, 100% open to conversations, and and I would say, even if you're on the 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 sales side of 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 ad tech platforms, like I'm happy to. I've had conversations um, in the last month or so with ad tech vendors, um, really just talking philosophically about about where they're at because they, I think, those vendors are in it for the long game. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they're like, he's probably he might think that he might need this thing, or his team, his team wherever he ends up, might be interested in this thing. So we'll have a conversation. Um, but what I'd say is, they didn't try and sell me anything. They were just like, ah, let's have a chat. Like, yeah, this is where the space is going. Yeah, LinkedIn is the new black book, as they say, or the new Rolodex. I think it is. I think it is. And and I would say is, I kind of wish. I'd got into it earlier. Um, I know there's that there's, you know, there's no perfect time, and I'm glad I'm I'm in there sharing and mm -hmm. connecting with more people now. But I wish I'd done it sooner because um, it's allowing me to, even though I'm stepped back from the industry, it's allowing me to stay connected with the industry, um, mm -hmm. and and just meet some really interesting people that I should have probably known already. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Matthew, this has been brilliant. I may see you on the metaverse. I think you may. I, I'm just going to drag you in and be like, right, okay, Dean, get your Oculus headset. We are going on a ride. 
um, I, I am genu genuinely interested to see how it unfolds. I, I just, I can't see the applications yet. Mm -hmm. If somebody explains an application, I can go, I get it. Like the blockchain and, and moving house or, you know, um, you know, buying something on the blockchain that makes sense because it's a it's a bit more transparent yeah. than than how we do commerce now. So I get that application. I honestly don't get NFTs. I think uh, it's the uh, the current NFTs. Yes, I would say. Um, I think NFTs are interesting. Um, I cannot afford the ones that I'm interested in um and there does seem to be a large amount of vanity around nfts but i love the idea i was like the guy that set up reddit who's serena williams's husband it's funny i always refer to him as oh he's serena williams's husband but he um he, he started he's got this new venture company and there's this company that's created uh i think it's called americana they've basically been they created this chip that's going to enable you to create have an nft for anything so like i'm into shoes so nike maybe put a chip in the shoe and the and it's and it can be anything it could be a shoe it could be a skateboard it could be a camera it basically then creates that digital definitive version of it and enables then in theory either the company who owned it could take when i sell it on they could take a transact but in they it it's like it validates it Mm -hmm. so much more and like in the world of sneakers for example there are so many fakes yeah in the reselling space if nike could put a thing in and they could 100 percent guarantee that that was definitively the real shoe that has there's application there but the and then for art i can see that but am i gonna spend three hundred thousand dollars on a board ape and and more Probably not. Am I going to spend 30 grand on artifacts, shoes? I'd love to, the digital shoes. I don't have the money. Yeah, and we'd have to figure out how to wear them. Well, well, the, well that's the thing is, is I think there's a, um, this is, this could go, this, this could go elsewhere. But if you think about the concept of ownership, the concept of ownership has shifted somewhat from the physical to the virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you think about, I don't know if you have a Spotify account, I'm, I'm all on Apple music cause I'm in the ecosystem, but most people I know are on Spotify. You don't technically own that stuff. Mm -hmm. sort of renting it. And even if you buy, you don't technically own it in the same way. And so the idea of ownership has changed. And I think what that means then, Hopefully they can edit that cough there out. I'm, I'm, um, the idea of ownership has changed. So the, in the virtual world, you don't need to physically own the thing, say that you own that thing. And so you and I could trade it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that people are more comfortable with that now. Whereas before, you'd be like, no, I definitely want these shoes. Yeah. That I'm up. And um, that's, uh, that, that's different. Did you see did you see the guy who bought Jack Dorsey's original tweet? I did. Oh well. 2.9 million dollars and then couldn't sell it for 280 dollars. And that and that's the problem. Like it had intrinsic value to him at that moment for 2.9 million. But to you and I, I won't pay 10p for it. Yeah, and clearly the rest of the world wouldn't pay more than a few thousand. I, I can download a copy of it from Google Images. Ah, but it's not the original. It's not the original. And so, but I, I think it changes. Um, but it's just this concept of ownership has has changed, and I think we'll see that as we move forward. The fact that there could be in the virtual space one of one is interesting. The fact that you've got a JPEG of it, it's not the one of one um you know and maybe that's like um i don't know like if you think like you could go and buy a monet for 50 million well i couldn't unless i win the lottery um or you could go and buy a print or you could mm -hmm. download it but you have the original mm -hmm. and there's probably maybe andy warhol's better a, a better way of framing that 
um, than necessarily Monet with all of the paint and stuff. But, you know, it's that is definitively that's the original. There are, will be many, many copies, but you have that. And I think that that's where it is. But I think I think we're in this weird NFT bubble at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and we won't talk about the sustainability aspect of it either. Yeah right now i got i got um i'll I'll, we'll wrap up with this one but i got a a message on linkedin the other day and it was called um uh they were basically selling a service called native oh i need to look this up because it, it was like what the hell are you talking about and then when i after googling it for a while to figure out what it was Mm. it was like you're basically offering a pump and dump service. That's so bad. And it was like, I didn't know what it was called. And I was like, what the hell is this? And then somebody said, oh, Google it, Google it, put the word crypto next to it and Google it. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh my, here it is, native shilling. Oh my. So you can buy people who will go on social media and rant and rave about this to pump the price up so you can sell it to some sucker and make some money. And that, that is breaking the influencer rules. Yeah. Um, Because conceptually that's there for influencer market. If somebody's been paid for a thing, but yes, that's so bad. That's so bad. But then uh, we we, we will end. Isn't that just what Elon does? (laughs) Yeah. Oh my word! And it is Jordan Belfort, just round an, another digital version of Jordan Belfort, really, isn't it? It's yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, Matthew, I look forward to seeing where you end up. Thank you. I'll keep tabs on you on LinkedIn. Um, if you've enjoyed this session and you're curious to ha- find out more of Ma- Matthew's thoughts and to know more about why he's got skateboards on his wall, <laughs> he will tell you if you ask him. I will. You can connect with Matthew on LinkedIn. We'll put a link to Matthew's profile somewhere here, somewhere. But thanks for joining us today. And Matthew, really appreciate you coming on. No, thank you, Dean. It was great. It was great. Thank you.